Hello friends, kind strangers, assorted creatures, welcome to the Demiurge Diaries. I am bad at expressing myself, except I'm not. This video is me doing a worse job at what I usually try to accomplish on purpose. Compare and contrast, and yes, you, the very observant one in the back, this is me showing you the lens. Look at the lens, I sure hope you like the lens. I also sure hope you are familiar with my writing, because this will make very little sense otherwise. There's an article on my site called The Anarch's Guide to Media, in which I try to make a case that the term canon, as it is colloquially used, is not only fascist, but also utterly meaningless if you dig down a bit, because no one actually only believes the things which a work states explicitly. We take the provided material as a keyhole view into a fully fleshed out world which has a history, far more characters, thoughts which are not spoken aloud nor printed on a page, and tons of undisplayed actions of the relevant figures like sleeping or going to the bathroom. The only thing that separates fanfiction from the version of any story which you hold in your head is that one of them has been written down. One of you has created art and meaningfully contributed to our shared cultural inventory. Thanks for that. The derisive modern view of fanfic is a recent phenomenon, meant to protect IP and foster idol worship for high-profile creators. Through most of history, reinventing and iterating upon popular myths and stories was the norm. Never forget that. Just as common land has been shredded to bits and privatized to a point where the very idea seems ridiculous to some, these are the proud, stubborn remnants of our once sprawling commons of symbols and collective mythopoesis. The endlessly adaptive or traditions upon which every culture on this planet is built. A vast, beautiful symphony of human creativity being brutally strangled by the gloved hands of mouse and friends. Some of you might have been radicalized against this idea by a Sarah Z video that was recent when I first wrote the script, but has aged a year since. Now, on the whole, the piece is good, and makes it far easier to talk to non-AO3 gremlins about fanfic, but nonetheless there are some glaring issues. It draws the distinction between fanfic and stuff like Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno, and Folklore as one of quality, amount of novel content, and perception that you are even writing about something fictional to begin with, since these authors were probably true believers for the most part. None of these hold up. Sure, John Milton is probably a better writer than most of us, but the quality distinction seems the most like a cop-out. Because there were plenty of bad, thematically similar stories that we, and by we I mean they, also don't call fanfic. So it's clearly not where they actually draw the line. It's just a cheap comeback. Oh, you think you're the next Dante Alighieri? Novelty content is similarly silly. Sure, Dante essentially invented a modern conception of hell, it isn't just a rehashing of a known work with more homoerotic subtext, but there's plenty of fanfic which is entirely novel. Novel to the point where it's kind of a joke, that the author changed everything about the setting and crafted a fully original stories but retained the character names. AU fix and such. If you think fanfic is just retellings with mild alterations, then you haven't read a lot of fanfic. I'm not accusing Sarah of that, by the way. As for reality perception, you have to cherry pick to make that one work. It's a nice excuse to exclude Bible fiction, which is admittedly prevalent, but it doesn't hold up broadly. Goethe's Faust is one of the most important works of German literature. It's great. It's so great, in fact, that for decades after its publication, writing a Faust was a sort of rite of passage among authors of the time. No, this doesn't mean writing a magnum opus of similar depth, it means writing a very similar story, mostly with the same characters, that none of them could have possibly thought were real. Heinrich Heine, one of our greatest poets, wrote a Faust called Der Dr. Faust, ein Tanzpoem, and it is unquestionably fanfic. Any sane person would look at it and go, yep, that's fanfic, all right. And there are plenty more examples of this type. They're just not quite as popular as the easily dismissed Bible examples. It also doesn't work the other way around. People who write celebrity fic are true believers in the source material, but you still call it fanfic, because at the end of the day, the only relevant factor is age and esteem. Fanfic is a new, derisive term for an old trend, because exploring beyond the keyhole is a fundamental human impulse. Aisha Euphara's Puss in Heels is a rom-com sci-fi retelling of Puss in Boots, the 16th century Italian fairy tale about a cat bringing its owner riches through trickery when he decides to trust it. 
Puss in Heels isn't actually about a cat, the corresponding role is filled by a broken sex robot, which the sardonic rodent man of a protagonist inherits from an estranged relative. You get it, the story structure is the same, but if it weren't for the title you might not even notice. We're pretty used to retellings of fairy tales, and much more faithful ones, so surely this isn't fanfic, right? You can buy it on Amazon, but that's standard next to all Disney movies are fanfic, which I don't have a problem with, but oh well. What if I told you that Aisha Yufara is also a fanfiction author? Does that change anything for you? Why? Literally why? The last point was only made semi-explicitly, and it's that fanfic is more of a genre of literature, with its own tropes and stylistic qualities which make it distinguishable, and while that is true of a lot of the stuff that we generally talk about as fanfic, it isn't true of the underlying phenomenon. There's plenty of non-fanfic literature which shares these markers, and plenty of fanfic written by people who don't read fanfic which bears none of them. This distinctive stylistic toolbox happens to belong to the group which primarily writes fanfic, but it isn't an intrinsic quality of fanfic. Back to the point, all keyhole exploration is fanfic, all of it, it isn't a bad word, you're being psyop to protect IP. It's like with spoilers, once we hear or come up with a theory, it does not become a separate node attached to the piece of art, it becomes part of the piece. The cultural idea Game of Thrones includes all fan theories and fan fictions. George R. R. Martin is not its despot, there are no despots. The article tells the story through two characters, the archaeologist and the helmsman. It constructs its little metaphorical world and is overall just a lot less clear than the summary I just gave you. Why? Why don't I just express myself clearly if my aim is to convince? Why do I write the way I write when I'm not writing like this? The simple answer is honesty, but let's split it into two categories first, style and structure. Style. I do enjoy my 20 point Scrabble words, not only do they come naturally while typing, but they also appeal to me on a visceral level. I love a good word and do my best to remember them when I encounter a new one in the wild. That's the important thing to keep in mind. It's not like I go over the text and spruce it up, like I look at a line and go, oh no, this isn't off-puttingly verbose enough, time to insert some archaic sesquipedalia. In fact, more often than not I remove excessive lingo dumps when they seem out of place. I don't go through a thesaurus while writing, my vocabulary just became this way by growing up on fanfic and then getting into philosophy. The words I use are the words that come to mind and best express the idea. Except maybe circumlocution and a handful of other words like that, which I just like. I could say something else that would possibly fit even better, I have a lexicographic preference for the word circumlocution. I also have a lexicographic preference for the term lexicographic preference. But those are exceptions, for the most part I write the way I write because writing differently would be a misrepresentation of that which I mean. Dumbing it down would feel both condescending and would incur translational loss of meaning. Also, I'm writing in a way that I enjoy reading. But that already mildly includes the issue of secondary functions which difficult lingo fulfills. You've probably heard of slow and fast thinking, where fast thinking is something like intuitive cognition, while slow thinking is an actual reasoned solution. A common example is this. A baseball and a baseball bat collectively cost a dollar ten. The bat is a dollar more expensive than the ball. How much does the ball cost? The wrong, fast thinking answer that doesn't go through the mathematics and just pattern completes is ten cent. The correct, slow thinking answer is five cent. If you give people a quick fire round of questions, they are likely to blurt out the former because fast thinking usually works pretty well, just not here. The important bit is that people are far more likely to give the correct answer when the question is asked in a more convoluted way or when it is printed in a difficult to read font. We are already expending mental effort so inertia keeps it going and clicks us into slow think. Some people seem to believe that ostentatious locution attempts to create the illusion of depth where there is none, especially with regards to some philosophers, but I prefer to see it as a tool to make depth which would exist regardless of lingo intuitively accessible. That's the style angle, but it's less interesting and less significant. Toning it down in terms of semantic pretentiousness merely feels artless, and maybe a bit like an ineffective use of the tools at my disposal, but it barely feels dishonest. Structure, on the other hand, structure. 
My thoughts literally have characters. This is the honest way of portraying them. They're not Socratic dialogues even when they feel like it. The characters aren't a comprehension aid, they're part of the thought, and extracting them, as I am doing here, comes at a loss. My thoughts about media, IP, and canon contain the archaeologist and the helmsman. My thoughts about communication and self-expression contain the waitress and the gremlin. By way of making it a standard vlog in which I metaphorlessly and without storylines talk about the topics, I'm giving the reins exclusively to the waitress. This is not the gremlin's medium. In the process of squishing a plane of significance into this non-native mode, it has incurred wrinkles. The playing field is no longer level. Some ideas buried in the space between lines of text can no longer surface, and it's terrible. If you feel like this is a clearer, easier, and therefore better way of making points, it's because they're slightly different, easier points. The fact that it's not a story means that it's slightly dishonest, because not only do real people have character arcs, in my experience, they are nothing but character arcs. Diana Network One Dave Homestuck Zero. The Anarch's Guide to Media was partially inspired by Sarah Z's video about more more. Yes, this part was in the script even before I had to insert the earlier one, but I never had any intention of making this the Sarah Z episode, which it has now become. It's just... Her thoughts on media are endlessly fascinating to me, because I have no idea how she holds them as someone who exists in fanfiction circles. How does one sleep in that culture and come out of it thinking of more and more as a strange aberration, as people pretending that there is a character who isn't there? Sarah, we're pretending with all of these characters, it's fiction. <laughs> it's not even just any fiction, it's already fanfic. It's part of the cultural canon of Sherlock Holmes, far predating any of Moffat's bullshit. We all agree that there are characters in this world that aren't being shown on screen, right? We all agree that our readings of the portrayed characters vary. Why do you find it strange when media from a source that isn't the BBC interlocks with our cultural understanding of Sherlock? That's to be expected, right? Just another voice in the canon. Same as when people invent whole personalities and narratives for background characters, we decide for ourselves what to care about, and it doesn't necessarily overlap too much with whatever the original piece of media cared about. I promise that watching Sherlock is more enjoyable if you fill in some domestic murder husband shenanigans going on behind the scenes. A case in point, Martin Scorsese's 1973 movie Goncharov, which, despite what you might have been told, is not a real movie. It's an emergent metafiction of sorts, but in being an emergent metafiction, and despite the other things you might have been told, it is absolutely a real movie. You see, I was sick the past couple of days, by which I mean a year ago, reading Goncharov fanfic in a state of fugue-like delirium, and let me tell you, I feel like I've seen it. The scenes are in my brain more vividly than a bunch of movies I really have seen. Sure, Martin Scorsese maybe didn't really make it, despite what he says. Sure, maybe it was never even filmed, but it is a movie. Being a movie is part of its canon, just like being made by Martin is. We constructed it collectively, and we have decided that these things are true, just like they have decided that more more is interesting. Had Scorsese not bought into the meme, it wouldn't have changed anything, because we do not need his permission. There are no despots. The author is a character in the piece more so than an authority on it. In this case, literally, but always figuratively, any piece of media is only ever a starting point. Your brain's in charge of it now, and you can do with it what you please. Art is not in objects, it's in the interactions you have with an object, and those are necessarily idiosyncratic. One possible explanation is that Sarah isn't actually as bewildered as she pretends to be, and she simply does so because most of her audience doesn't have that cultural background, and is still cued into highly despotic modes of media consumption. But that's… cynical. I don't want to believe people are lying just because they disagree with me. I simply cannot fathom how she got to a point where she can be genuinely bewildered by more more. Mystery for the ages. Similar for her Homestuck video, and it's even more egregious there, since Homestuck was always, first through user submissions and then through the forums, a highly community democratic project. Tons of people have always been making Homestuck. Andrew Hussey's retirement wasn't so much a passing of the torch, and much more a simple stopping of one guy to interface with this property. 
The old guard of fanfiction authors, who always highly influenced the progression of the story as well as the communal interpretation thereof, simply became the dominant voice once another faded into the background. So why is the video so strangely focused on Hussey? The interesting thing about Homestuck is how democratic it was and is. Why does she put so much value into the continuation according to Homestuck Squared? Why not go with an alternative ending she prefers? The whole thing goes so far out of its way to label itself as only dubiously canon, as one story line among many, and a fading of the comic into the sea of adjacent world lines. I can't help but feel it's because this is the Hussey endorsed one. Sarah, please, you don't even like Hussey. Why are you clinging to despots? You are already free. Homestuck is ours. Sherlock is ours. If we want it, I don't want it, but you can have it. This ocean of media, born of so many minds and mouths and hands, haunted by such multitudes. We already collectively own all of it. No gods, no masters, no bullshit IP limiting the creative potential of humanity. If you want to read one of those adjacent storylines, why don't you read Deicide and Its Consequences by Aura Barista? Heard that's really good. Uh, Sarah, I'm talking to you right now, personally, I assume you're watching this. Um, <laughs> see you next time. Bye.